Hey there, I'm Lance and I'm a gamer. And I'm Sam and I'm a non-gamer. And we are Love to Hate, where we try to help gamers find great games to play with non-gamers. And today we're taking a look at Dreams of Yesterday by Weird Giraffe Games. Dreams of Yesterday is the uh, prequel of sorts to Dreams of Tomorrow, which is a game that Weird Giraffe Games came out with a few years back. We have a copy of it. And uh, now there is Dreams of Yesterday. It's a micro game and it is coming to crowdfunding. So make sure to check out the link to the campaign page down below after you watch our video. And as such, there's going to be some similarities in theme and mechanics a little bit to what you have here in Dreams of Tomorrow, but it's a completely different game. Let's take a look at it down below and then we'll come back and share our thoughts on it as a gamer and non-gamer. All right, I have Dreams of Yesterday from Weird Giraffe Games on the table. Now, I do want to make sure you understand that everything you see in this portion of the video is prototype. The final artwork components and maybe even some of the rules will may change once it's released from crowdfunding. That being said, let's go ahead and get into this micro game here. Now, it is just a card game, so you're going to have a deck of cards here, and these cards uh, are all you have. You don't have different types of cards. It's just a, a deck of cards, and uh, you are going to set this up in a manner where there is a market here of six cards, and you will keep the reserve cards over here. You will then uh, have your earn cards. So these cards are a little different, I suppose, because they have an earn on one side, and you will make sure that this is separate from the main deck here, and you will keep it off to the side. It will get shuffled into the deck of cards once you go through this deck. And then everybody will start the game with a two resource card. So this is the side of a card that has resources on it. And they will have one artifact exhibit card. And so these cards are double sided. And there are going to be things on the back sides of them. So this card in particular, it has an artifact on this side. But it also has an artifact on this side. Whereas... This card that I showed earlier had two resources, a trophy and money. On this side, it's going to have a crate, which the crate is going to count as a wild artifact. It can be any of the three types of artifacts. There are three artifacts in this game. You've got the Triceratops, you've got the Portrait, and you've got the Okapi, which is going to be on the back of this card right here. And so you will... Set the game up like such, and you're ready to go. Now, in this game, I'll go ahead and flip that back to the Triceratops. In this game, what you will be doing on your turn, you'll take a look at where the market is and wherever the open spot is in the market. So you've got a 3x3 three three grid here. Wherever there's not a card, that's where you are starting on your turn. You can move from this space going clockwise around this rondelle market here up to two spaces for free. So I could go here or I could go here and I could take any card that I'm able to travel to. Uh, resource cards, you can just simply take them and add them to your resource row and they will keep track of the resources that you have in the game. There are three different types of resources. You've got money, trophies, and books. If you wanted to take an artifact, however, you would have to pay the cost that is listed on the card right here. So in this case, I would need one money and one trophy. And you would use the resources that are in your resource row to be able to pay for that. So I could take this Triceratops here and uh, turn in my resource card because it matches the resources that are needed. Now, if I had this resource, for instance, I would not be able to get that. I would need to have something else uh, to get me that resource. Now, I do want to give you another example here. Let's say I had these two cards, for instance. Uh, I do have what I need to be able to get the Triceratops. Uh, because I have both money and a trophy, but I would lose this book because I uh, am using this card. I don't get change back. I would have to waste the book to be able to get this Triceratops. But that is the idea of what you're doing. Now, why do you want these artifacts? Well, the artifacts you get are immediately going to go in one of your exhibit rows. I'm going to go ahead and move this resource out of the way. You will have one artifact already to start the game, as I've already showed you. And uh, you have space for two exhibits. So the artifact starts in your exhibit row, and you will be putting more artifacts in that row. But you could start another exhibit row below that artifact and put artifacts there. What you are doing with these artifacts, you will be doing set collection. I want to try to connect my uh, artifacts that are the same by placing it either on the furthest right side or the furthest left side, making sure that the artifact is still seen 
covering up the action ability on the card wherever I end up playing it. That would be on the right side, covering up this action here, or I would tuck it under there on the left side of my exhibit row, covering up this action here and still leaving this action available to me. And again, you're just trying to match these artifacts. And the more artifacts that you have that match, the more points you will get. Now, if you did have to uh, start a new artifact, for instance, that would disrupt this line of artifacts, unless if I add it on the far left side here. But if I added another Triceratops going this way, I would be starting a new set. I would have two, art two Triceratops here, one portrait, and then another set of tri Triceratops. So you really want to try to keep your sets together for as many cards as you can. And that's really the idea of the game. Now, as I mentioned, there are actions that you can do on your uh, artifacts that are still visible to you. So this is going to be the artifact that is furthest right in your exhibit hall line. This particular icon here tells me that I can go one extra space for free. So again, you can go starting here, you can go up to two spaces for free. With this action, I could go up to three spaces for free. Now, if I wanted to go further than that, I would have to discard a resource card to go one extra space. So I could go up to four spaces by discarding this card. If I did not have this action, let's say I just had these resources here, I could discard this card right here to go up to three spaces. You can also discard a resource card to be able to flip one of the cards over. So maybe I see on the back side here, this icon here shows you what's on the back side of this card. I could discard a resource to flip this over to be able to take that side of the card, adding it to my exhibit hall. This particular icon here allows me to rearrange one spot in the, uh, the market here, maybe moving this card there and such. Uh, there are other actions on the cards. This is going to let me go reverse order. Uh, let's see if we can see some other abilities. This icon right here is going to let me use books as wild resources. And uh, there are other actions throughout the game. Uh, this would give me an automatic money resource each time, each round, each time it's my turn. And I don't have to discard this card to be able to use it. I would just have a continual money resource to be able to use. I'll leave you to, to uh, check out the rules to discover all the other different types of actions that you can do on these cards. But uh, ultimately what I'm doing, I'm trying to take the artifacts that give me the best sets. Now, as I mentioned, the crate here is going to let you count this as a wild resource, and it can go both ways. So in other words, I have two uh, Triceratops here, so I'm going to count this as a Triceratops, but if I were to get a portrait later on, I can not only count that as a Triceratops adding it to this set, but I could also count it as a portrait adding it to this set here. So that is a very nice thing to get. However, you are going to pay lots of resources to get uh, chests because you need this set of resources here or three of one kind of resource to be able to get the chest. Now, after your turn is over, so say maybe I do take uh, this chest here, adding it right there. Wherever I started my turn, so I started my turn right here, uh, moving one space, paying my resources to get this card, I take the top card of the draw deck, and I choose which side of the card I want to place, and it would go in the spot where I started my turn, and then it would be my opponent's turn starting from this space, again going one or two spaces clockwise around the rondelle, choosing their card that they want. Once this deck runs out, then you will shuffle in the discard pile with the urns, and the urns are going to come out into the market. And what you can do with an urn after paying the resources for it, it's going to give you a number of victory points just for having it, and it will also give you bonus victory points for having a particular condition. So this is one extra bonus point for every portrait that I have. And you're going to place this at the end of your exhibit, and that will close off that exhibit hall. You will not be able to do any other movement of cards that are in this exhibit hall. It is completely closed, and you will still have your other exhibit hall to work with. But once a player has two urns closing off both exhibit halls, that will end the game. 
And uh, that's one way the game can end. Another way the game can end is if the uh, draw deck does not have enough cards to refill the market, even after you include what any discard cards there might be. And so if somebody is just hoarding resources and not purchasing anything in the market, uh, this deck will run dry. And if that happens, then the game will end. That is something that you have to be aware of. That's the gist of the game. Uh, at the end, you will see who has the most points from the sets that they have made for themselves, as well as the points that you get from any urns that you've purchased and the sets that give you bonus points. Whoever has the most points is going to be the winner, and that's how you play Dreams of Yesterday. Let's go back up top and share our thoughts on this one. And we're back, and now we're going to share our thoughts on Dreams of Yesterday from a gamer and non-gamer's perspective. So, Sam, this is a micro game. It is just a small deck of cards. What do you think about this one? Um, I didn't um, see the case that it came in before I played it. Lance had already set everything up. And so seeing it just and knowing that the entire game fit in this case is actually very surprising because it feels so much bigger than that. Like, this is smaller than a normal deck of cards oh, yeah. and for it to be the game that it was um, I think really says a lot about their ingenuity and how they really use both sides of the card right. and and made this game with this amount of space. Yeah you surprisingly have a whole lot of game in this and, and, you, and if you watch the rules portion of the video you saw how many different mechanics are at play here. You are I mean, you are going to be managing resources, moving around a rondelle, trying to do set collection. There's a whole lot going on with this little yeah. tiny game. And like Sam said, you're using back sides, both sides of the cards, which is it's just really cool that they were able to squeeze that much out of yeah. 18, 20, 25 cards, however many cards there are. Yeah. Uh, talk about complexity level and just trying to figure your way, your way out in this game as a non-gamer. I mean, it was pretty straightforward. I, I kept forgetting which direction to go on the rondelle, but other than that's just because I'm dyslexic, Awkward. so <laughs> that doesn't mean anything to me. Um, but other than that, I think it was a pretty straightforward game. I mean, the the set collection and um, and it's fairly quick as well. Yeah. Um, so it was it was easy to catch on. Yeah. I think this is a game that you do need to play one or two turns yeah. to really kind of grasp what's going on. And then after you've played it one or two times, I think there's still some intricacies about it that are still there for you to unpack. Yeah, I think by the end of it, I was like, okay, I could play this again, and I think my strategy would be a little bit yeah, different. Yeah, for sure. Because you can really speed up the game by taking those resources and there not being a deck to refill the, the rondelle. That can be one way to play the game, but then you could also play the opposite of that and really try to slow the game down to make sure you have your sets the way you need them to be to try to win the game. So yeah. there's, there's a lot at play here with this. You can play out multiple strategies. I don't think it's so complex that a, a non-gamer can't play it with a gamer. I think this is a, it's a great game to play between couples where there's a gamer and non-gamer or so um, it still has that same feel that dreams of yester or dreams of tomorrow excuse me had with it and so there you can see the draw there between the two games and why they're connected um, but it is its own game it's completely different um, it's a micro game and so you can take it just about anywhere yeah, and play it is, anywhere I think this is going in our travel yep. basket for sure yeah well, that's uh, our thoughts here on Dreams of Yesterday. As we mentioned at the top of the video, it is on crowdfunding, so make sure to check out the link down below in the description now that you've watched our video. And leave us some comments down below. Let us know what you think about this game. Make sure to like and subscribe and push that bell button so you get notifications of all our new content. I'm Lance. And I'm Sam. And we are Love to Hate, where we try to bridge the gap between gamers and non-gamers. We'll catch you next time.